October 6, 1973. The well-trained, well-equipped army of Israel seems invincible. But within a day, Egypt and Syria overwhelmed the Israelis in a massive surprise attack. One of the fiercest clashes of men and machines in history is underway. Thousands will die during the 19 days of the October War. This is the mosque of Muhammad Ali in Cairo, Egypt. Here, the Muslim faithful gather every Friday for communal prayer. Like millions across the Middle East, these worshipers humble themselves before God and pledge their devotion to the words of the prophet Muhammad. In nearby Israel, Jews pray at the western wall of Jerusalem's old city. This is Judaism's holiest site, but it is also sacred to Muslims and Christians. Until 1967, Jerusalem was part of the nation of Jordan. Then, during the Six-Day War, Israel captured the city, as well as large amounts of territory from Egypt and Syria. For Israelis, gaining Jerusalem was a military and a religious victory. But to many Arabs, the loss of the holy city was a black day for Islam. Egypt's territorial losses were not as religiously charged as the capture of Jerusalem, but the blow to its pride demoralized this ancient nation. As the leaders of the Arab nationalist movement, Egyptians had inspired the Arab world with their pride in their culture and their refusal to be manipulated by the superpowers. Israel considered Egypt its most dangerous opponent. The two countries had been in almost constant battle since 1948, when the Zionist state was formed. Israel held the Egyptians at bay, but neither side scored a decisive victory until the Six-Day War, when Israel crushed the Egyptian army and captured another symbol of Arab pride, the Suez Canal, a pivotal part of the Egyptian economy. Bridging the Mediterranean and Red Seas, the 101-mile canal links the east with the west, allowing oil to flow from the Gulf states to Europe and beyond. The canal has been fought over since it opened in 1869. The British Empire conquered Egypt to gain control of the waterway, and they held it for 72 years until they were driven out in 1956. Egypt controlled the canal until 1967, when Israel launched a surprise attack against its Arab neighbors. In less than a week, Israel captured the entire Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank of Jordan, and the Golan Heights. The state of Israel nearly quadrupled in size. Besides gaining land, Israel emerged from the Six-Day War with the reputation of having one of the finest armies in the world. Their success at fast-moving attacks, particularly armor assaults, was undeniable. Israel's leaders were convinced that their military superiority was absolute. When the Arab nations sought to negotiate a settlement for their captured lands, Israel's response was half-hearted. They felt no need to negotiate. Realizing that Israel would never meet his demands, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat set into motion a plan to recapture the Suez Canal and to wipe out the humiliation of the Six-Day War. The plan was called Operation Spark. It called for a shocking military action that would result in a political solution to the Sinai crisis. Sadat's goal was to cross the Suez, bloody the Israeli army, and recapture the canal and as much of the Sinai as possible. At this point, he reasoned, the superpowers and the rest of the United Nations would intervene. Then, Israel would be forced to bargain. Sadat and his generals made sure that Operation Spark would not be a repeat of the 1967 disaster. 
the Egyptian army spent months training for the assault, using new weapons purchased from the Soviet Union with money supplied by Saudi Arabia. To further improve his odds, Sadat looked for another nation to attack Israel in the north as he struck in the south. He found an eager partner in Syria. The border between Syria and Israel is called the Purple Line, and today it looks much as it did in 1973. Miles of mines, anti-tank ditches, and electrified fences separate these two long-time antagonists. The Israelis smooth the sand along their fences, then search for the footprints of intruders. A small demilitarized zone monitored by the United Nations keeps both sides at a safe, if uncomfortable, distance from each other. Syria planned to attack here and across the rest of the Purple Line on October 6th, the date Sadat had set for the invasion. In Islam, this was the seventh day of Ramadan, a time of fasting and prayer. In the Hebrew calendar, it was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest of all Jewish days. Breaking through the Purple Line would be a hard fight for the Syrians, but it paled before the task of crossing the Suez. Israel had turned the canal's east bank into the most formidable defensive barrier in the world. They called it the Bar Lev Line, and part of it still stands today. The front of the line was a 70-foot high wall of sand studded with heavily armed strongholds. Even if an Egyptian force managed to cross the canal through heavy gunfire, the IDF calculated that it would take them hours to blast holes through the sand wall, giving Israel ample time to send reinforcements to the front. Clearly, attacking the Bar Lev line was suicide, but on October 6, 1973, Egypt launched just such an attack. It was a great night. The evening, uh, about after midnight with 30 minutes, we met all the commanders, shaked hands, kissed each other, and we gave a, a holy swear that we will do all our best to win, because we have no choice. We have to win or to die, nothing else. <laughs> The attack began at 1,400 hours. Egypt pounded the entire length of the Bar Lev line with every weapon available. As Egyptian bombers blasted communications positions, 4,000 guns rained shells down on the Bar Lev strongholds in a 20-minute barrage. Israel's air force flew to the rescue, only to be met by surface-to-air missiles. At 1420, Egyptian troops carried 1,000 assault rafts to the banks of the Suez. Rangers had already slipped across and sabotaged the Bar Lev line's ultimate defense against attackers, a pipeline of oil that was to be poured into the canal and set aflame. The first wave of attackers carried anti-tank weapons, bridge-laying equipment, and high-pressure water pumps. The water pumps were the ingenious solution to the problem of the 70-foot sand barrier. Israel thought it would take at least 12 hours to penetrate the barrier using explosives, but by simply using water to wear down the sand, Egypt broke through in less than three. The water hoses opened large gaps in the sand barrier. Then some of our forces unfolded bridges into the water and took them from the west side to the east side in order to connect them with the bridgehead that was just opened. Then bulldozers proceeded to flatten a road so the rest of our forces could cross from the bridges. Some soldiers used wooden ladders to climb over the huge sand barrier in the areas that did not get opened by the hoses. I was a major commanding a unit. I carried my weapons, which were a rifle and a pistol, as well as lots of ammunition and lots of supplies and water, plus anything else that would facilitate my mission. 
All of that would have weighed about 40 kilograms. The crossing was marked by very high morale. It was also marked by the cry, God is great. Israel had built 33 fortified outposts along the Barlev line, each about six miles apart. Only 16 were operational on the day of the attack. The 600 soldiers manning the fortresses were stunned by the sight of tens of thousands of Egyptian troops swarming toward them. The first stronghold fell less than an hour after the attack began, and the rest began to follow in a domino effect. For the IDF, it was almost inconceivable. Arab soldiers, never considered worthy opponents, had taken them by surprise. When you are ready for war, and all the arrangements are finished, you will feel like students who finished all his studies and ready for the exam next day. It has been for us a great pleasure to share in that war, because we know exactly who are the Israeli troops and who are the Israeli commanders. We have been looking to them from the war of 67 in front of us till the day of the 6th of October. We know their capacity. We know what they can do. And we know what we can do. And that land was ours. Israel's second line units, posted some 10 miles behind the Barlev line, went into action. Tanks were sent to the front without infantry or air support, breaking one of the cardinal rules of armored warfare. They paid the price. Charging IDF tanks were ambushed by Egyptian soldiers carrying wire-guided Sagar missiles and handheld RPG-7s. IDF losses were heavy. A crucial advance in technology had given Egyptian foot soldiers the edge over the IDF Armored Corps, which was far better at fighting other tanks than men lying in ambush. By the end of October 6th, Egypt had overrun the Barlev line. 14 Israeli strongholds had been captured. Five bridges and 10 decoys now linked the east and west banks of the Suez Canal. Five infantry divisions, roughly 80,000 men, had crossed over to the Sinai with 208 killed, a death toll much lower than the Egyptians had expected. Behind the front lines, Israel's general staff was in a state of near panic. Reserve units were being hastily mustered together, and battalions in the rear were rushed to the front. Many senior commanders refused to accept the severity of the situation. They simply could not believe that Egypt was capable of launching a successful attack. The men who went to the front discovered the truth. The worst thing I experienced was our division's deputy commander telling me, Asaf Yaguri, your battalion is the first battalion to reach the canal out of the reserve battalions. Today, we have got four working tanks between the Suez Canal and Tel Aviv. This means that on the northern axis, there are no armored forces but yours. Then, I met a group of four armored men standing in tank patches blackened by soot, embarrassed and beaten. And what they said to me was, we are refugees from the strongholds. God save your souls in the hell you are going to. Of course, with the beginning of the war, there was total destruction in more than one location. And a lot of people were destroyed and died. But I keep saying that the noble cause is to liberate my land. This will make anything worth sacrificing. This is Tel Aviv, Israel's second largest city. Approximately 320,000 people live here, out of Israel's total population of 5 million. The country is so small and its enemies are so numerous that every able-bodied citizen is expected to fight for his country. At the age of 18, Israelis are drafted into the army. Men serve for three years, women for two. 
Afterwards, men and unmarried women are assigned to reserve units. These units train together constantly, year after year. Many of the soldiers who fought side by side in the October War still train together today. Often they work together or live in the same neighborhoods. These close-knit, cradle-to-grave units make effective fighting teams, but they also turn every battlefield into a graveyard filled with friends. When war broke out October 6, 1973, men and women across the country listened for orders given in code on the radio. We got a message that we must reach our unit. Uh, we also heard on the radio that there is probably going to be a war breaking out and that Syrian and Egyptian airplanes were attacking our forces. In the Golan Heights and in the Sinai, Israel had opted for a dangerous defensive strategy, a heavy reliance on tanks without much infantry support. Tank battalions were expected to hold off the enemy until troops were mobilized and brought to the front. Since no one felt Syria or Egypt capable of launching a competent assault, this gamble seemed logical. Now the IDF would pay a heavy price for its overconfidence. As we were going up to the Golan Heights, we kept on hearing on the radio and also saw in the horizon the shelling and bombing of the Syrian Air Force and our plans, their plans. We did not feel it was going to be a long war. The feeling was that within a day or two, we would finish this affair and go back home. Syria planned to recapture the whole of the Golan Heights by the end of the first day of battle with an overpowering combined arms assault. At 2 p.m., just as Egypt attacked the Suez, five Syrian divisions, armed with some 900 T-62 and T-55 tanks, swarmed toward the Purple Line. They faced just two Israeli brigades that were stretched across the length of the front, armed with less than 150 tanks. The southern Golan was defended by the men of the Barak Brigade, a unit that was almost completely wiped out on the first day of battle. Israel's elite 7th Armored Brigade held the north. The 77th Battalion of 7th Armored was commanded by then Lieutenant Colonel Avignor Kahalani. Kahalani and his two dozen tanks bore the brunt of the attack on the northern Golan in the area now called the Valley of Tears. We saw them arrive from the east crossing the border, crossing the uh, anti-tank ditches, and crossing the minefield. We saw the lights, the infrared lights, and they cross the border and they arrive very close to our tanks. They uh, used the night very well. In, in the south of the Golan Heights, they capture, after 24 hours, most of the Golan Heights. The brigade that we had over there, they couldn't stop them and they capture all the area. In my area, I have decided to shoot all over the night just the direction to the east to give them the feeling that we are there and we know they are coming, but we couldn't really hit their tanks. It's uh, all over the, the first night. We just play with them. We couldn't hit them. We waited the entire night in ambush, after we fought all day. At night we stayed awake and we just waited and waited to see where the shots would come from and waited to see where the flashes were coming from so we could find our motors. Suddenly the tanks in our platoon were attacked by their bazookas. In southern Golan, the survivors of the Barak Brigade fought a doomed battle against three Syrian divisions. A brigade raced to their rescue, led by then-Colonel Ori Orr. The first and the second days of the Yom Kippur War were the most difficult days of my life. I needed more time. Because if I had more time, it would be another platoon, another company, another tank to accumulate forces for defense. That heavy feeling I had on that first day, the second day, that I don't have the sufficient power to face the Syrians. 
And it came to expression in the most difficult battle I've had. It was the battle of Nafakh. We were surprised because already in Nafakh, we saw Syrian tanks right in front of us firing at us. Actually, the first time, I felt like it was a real war, not just an exercise like we were used to, was when I saw that on my left and right, friends were getting hit and killed, tanks were getting hit and catching fire, and a lot of the battalion soldiers of our company were dead. Ori Orr split his brigade of 40 tanks into two, sending a small force to attack head-on, while a larger force snuck up from behind. It was a classic armor maneuver that enabled Orr's small force to overpower the Syrians. This battle lasted about four, five, up to eight hours if I add up everything. The end of the battle was that we actually stopped that brigade, destroyed most of it. We narrowed the defense line and the Syrians did not reach Nafakh again. A large part of the company commanders were wounded. Some of them got killed. One died later on. And I will never forget for the rest of my life that night that we sent infantry to collect the wounded left in the field from the tanks that got hit. I rebuilt the entire brigade's crew all over again. I found myself with 25 meters in front of my tanks. I met three T-62, and the three commanders looked straight to my eyes, and I was alone. And I jumped to my uh, tank, and I moved the main gun to the right tank, and I scream on my gunner to shoot immediately and he couldn't see the target because it was so close to his telescope and he saw just uh, a green line a green uh, color in, in in the face and um, he asked me so many questions what is the range and uh, why we are shooting and the first time i found why the designer designed the gunner will sit very close to your legs and of course I kicked him, kicked him, and he shot. And I moved the gun to the second tank, and he shot again, and I moved the gun to the third one, and he was ready to shoot me. And something happened with the empty shell, and in the last moment we shot first. Um, it was uh, really, uh, uh, it's like a knife battle. It's, it's, it's never happened in our history to shoot so close. Usually you shoot uh, three kilometers, two kilometers far, but no uh, so close. In the first engagement, there is no question of who hit whom. We hit them hard, and it was really a contest among the tank soldiers who could knock out more tanks. My tank in the first battle knocked out only 15 tanks. That was very little in relation to how many the battalion knocked out. On Saturday night, the night of Yom Kippur, we counted the number of blazes. We stopped counting at 80. Don't think too much. It's uh, so fast, and I have to do it like uh, the Western story, Western movie, in, uh, like a Bill Carter or a John Wine. It's almost the same. You have to shoot very fast and to try to hit all of them. You're so scared, you don't think. You hit and again and again and again. This is the Banat Yaakov Bridge, spanning the River Jordan. On the night of October 7th, the Syrian division reached this bridge and paused. Before them lay an undefended road that could take them straight into the heart of Israel. But to the division commander, it looked too good to be true. Knowing a perfect spot for an ambush when he saw one, he stopped his advance and waited for dawn. This gave the Israelis just enough time to send troops up to stop him. After the war, the Syrian commander was executed for his poor judgment. The fighting in the Golan Heights went on day and night, nonstop. The IDF tradition of armor commanders leading their forces into battle, typically standing in the turrets of their tanks, resulted in heavy losses amongst the leadership. 
almost all the tank commanders under Colonel Kahalani died in battle. We have a prayer, in, a Jewish prayer in the morning, that everybody say that, uh, uh, thank you, God, that you didn't make me a woman. But during the combat, you sometimes want to change the prayer. It's mean that uh, you prefer not to be there. It's a really a bad situation. You can see many of your friends were killed. And from my experience, I can tell you that I didn't try to think about that. I saw them, I saw what happened to them, and I closed my eyes and looked to the enemy to try to identify who is going to kill me now, and I tried to kill him first. I saw on the roadside one of our soldiers lying down, seriously wounded. Then I was in a very serious and difficult dilemma. I was torn between the decision to get out of the tank, take him, turn around with the tank and evacuate him because he was wounded, or to go on with my mission, drive on in order to block, and I remind you, we were in the situation of uh, blocking the Syrians. Then I decided to stop the tank. Behind me were two or three more tanks, but I stopped the tank, I got out with the canteen, and I gave the fellow some water. He grabbed my hand, grabbed me hard, and yelled in Hebrew, Hanan, help me, take me away from here, because I'm wounded. He was severely wounded, at least one leg was blown away, and he was bleeding. The fact he called me Hanan increased my dilemma even more because he knew me. I could not recognize him because he was so badly wounded. Eventually, I forcefully broke myself off from him, from his stronghold of my hand. I got on my tank and continued. I continued understanding, knowing that I made the right decision. I continued to fight against the Syrian tanks. This is the Sinai Peninsula, approximately 10 miles from the banks of the Suez Canal. In 1973, thousands of men fought and died here. Now the carcasses of their killing machines are all that remain to mark their passing. The tank battle is similar to the dinosaur fights of long ago. The fighting is intense and gruesome. The one who has the first blow is the victor. On October 8, 1973, after two days of steadily losing ground to the Egyptian army, the commanders of the Israeli Defense Forces felt the time was right for a counterattack. Most of the strongholds along the Bar Lev line had been overrun, but a few still held out, and the IDF was determined to rescue them. But communications problems, misunderstandings, poor intelligence gathering, and a continued refusal to take the Egyptian army seriously resulted in disaster. What was intended to be a division-sized, combined arms assault turned into a suicide mission. After the war, the events of October 8th were the subject of extensive investigation. Ultimately, the blame was laid at the feet of the senior commanders who stayed well away from the front lines and disregarded the counsel of their field commanders. The battle is one of the most controversial in IDF history. This is an M60 tank which was driven by the Israeli commander Asaf Yaguri, commander of the 190th Armored Battalion, which attacked our forces that were pushing from the West Bank to the East Bank towards the center. The tank, the Egyptians stood up as a statue for their victory, is a joke. 
First of all, the tank they display is a pattern, and my tanks were all centurion. Secondly, my tank exploded. The entire Israeli attack consisted of one battalion attacking from all the armed forces, my battalion, against the whole army entrenched in ditches and positions with tanks and artillery. There was no chance that a battalion would beat such an army in a daylight attack, especially being just a few hundred meters range from the canal. In this hopeless battle, almost all of our tanks were destroyed. The battalion commander's platoon, which consisted of three tanks, reached together with me the stronghold line, which is where we were supposed to go. Only at that time, we were left with three lone tanks. The battalion deputy commander's tank got a hit and blew up. A third tank caught fire and started to burn. My tank took a direct hit in its thread. The Sagers opened fire. My consideration was should we stay in this fire trap or get the crew out, at least to save the people. Asaf Yaguri and his crew were taken prisoner, and Yaguri became Egypt's highest-ranking Israeli POW. When the war ended, he was the last soldier released. Now the IDF realizes that removing Egypt from the Sinai will not be a simple task. How well are the Egyptians fighting you at the moment? Are they more stubbornly than before? Yes, I think that uh, they uh, have no ground to complain under their forces. I think they uh, should have very uh, basic ground to complain under their politicians, but I don't think the soldiers should be blamed. No, nothing wrong with the soldiers. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the Golan Heights, the war between Syria and Israel had been raging non-stop for three days. Commanders and their crews were on the verge of complete exhaustion. Here, in the Valley of Tears, the fighting reached its peak. Colonel Kahalani's 77th Battalion had only six tanks left, and their ammunition was almost gone. The Syrians had surrounded the 77th Battalion and the rest of the 7th Armored Brigade. Tanks were fighting now one-on-one -on -one at point-blank range. But just as defeat seemed inevitable, a rescue party of 13 tanks poured onto the ridge above the valley and opened fire on the Syrian forces below. Soon the Syrians retreated, leaving hundreds of ruptured tanks and armored vehicles in their wake. I think that today the Syrian will learn that the road from Damascus to the state of Israel also runs from the state of Israel to Damascus. Now that the Israelis had the initiative, and despite the exhaustion of their troops, they decided to press their advantage and drive the Syrians back to the Purple Line. In southern Golan, Orior's brigade launched a savage attack on the oncoming Syrians, who by this point were as weary and shell-shocked as their opponents. A tremendous artillery bombardment was falling on us. My communication officer inside my vehicle got very severely wounded. We evacuated him and we succeeded, while suffering casualties, to chase the Syrians back in a very difficult battle as the sun set. We heard the Syrian commander on the radio saying that he could not withstand the attack and asking for permission to withdraw. He did not receive this permission. 
Then he said he was going to withdraw anyway. So we managed to carry out the mission and it gave us some breathing space. Time to get organized for the next stage of war. I think there are several drives, forces, that drive combatants on the battlefield. And none of them have to do with ideological conceptions like country, duty, honor. I think one simple drive is survival. You fight decisively because on many occasions that's the only way to stay alive. You know that if you want to hit first, the enemy would. The other explanation for why people fight has to do with the uh, social aspect, I would call it. You fight for your friends, for your comrades, for your buddies. And the third explanation, I believe, has to do with uh, leadership, with the commanders. There is only one thing that can make you do that, come out of your shelter and, and assault, and that's if somebody else will do it in front of you. And it, this will usually be the, the commander. From 73 war, I uh, remember the moment that uh, I couldn't control my tanks, and I tried to convince them to move forward, and they didn't move. And I saw that I'm uh, I'm bad commander. I have difficulty to control my unit, and it was very uh, very shame. Uh, that I couldn't, but uh, most of them were scared. It was uh, a leadership problem to convince them to move forward. The only way to convince them it was to tell them that they are chickens. I called my soldiers chickens. I would like to say that the firing and the exploding shells and the ricochets, it's all camouflage. The real war is not outside, but in your head. Because being a commander is a tremendous responsibility you have over the men. And I saw in the Yom Kippur War to what extent the men are obedient, how much the men wanted someone to tell them what to do, to have an address, who to look up to, and to have someone they can count on. And I saw while well in the war what a huge responsibility I had as a brigade commander. Anything I said to the men, I can tell you this for sure they would do because they trusted me with their eyes closed. I didn't have to yell at all. I would quietly say, gentlemen, this is where we stand, this is where we spread, this is where we defend. October 11th, 1973, in the Valley of Tears. By this point, Israel has launched a counterattack into Syria that will take the IDF to the gates of Damascus. They leave behind them the detritus of battle, the carcasses of over 500 tanks. The momentum of the battle is now with the Israelis, but both sides have paid a heavy price. Israel's losses are high, 772 killed, 2,500 wounded. Syrian losses are even worse, 6,900 wounded, 3,600 dead. I think the Syrians were, were, were very unlucky not to break through in the first instance. They very nearly did it. But then, of course, they ran into trouble because they, were, they ran up against very heavily reinforced Israeli forces knew how to deal with them on fairly, fairly close ground. And then the Egyptians, who didn't want to advance very much in the south to begin with, having scored their initial success, suddenly woke up to the fact that unless they did something to take the pressure off the Syrians, there were going to be serious consequences, which indeed there were anyway. So they were forced into an attack which they didn't really want to do. After a week of battle, Egypt's generals were pleased with their progress. They had fortified their positions on the canal and were content with gradually advancing, knowing that in a slow war of attrition, their superior numbers would win the day. But Syria's plea for help was too strong to ignore. So on October 14th, Egypt launched a major offensive. At first, things went well for them. The Egyptian army deployed well over 1,200 tanks, and they managed to penetrate 14 miles in one key sector. But the Israelis were prepared, and the fighting was brutal. So brutal that within 12 hours, Egypt had pulled back to their starting point. 
the Egyptian army had run directly into a wall of artillery, tanks, and infantry lying in ambush. In 12 hours of battle, the Egyptians lost over 250 tanks and suffered more than 1,000 casualties. The IDF claims it lost only six tanks. More days of attrition warfare followed. The IDF began preparing a major counteroffensive. By October 15th, Israel was ready for a surprise canal crossing of its own. The plan was conceived by Major General Ariel Sharon, who until July had been the commander of the IDF Southern Forces. Sharon's bitter infighting with his replacement, Major General Shmuel Gonin, was part of the controversy that raged in Israel after the war had ended. Sharon and General Bren Adan, the head of the IDF Armored Corps, spearheaded an assault that drove a wedge between the Egyptian Second and Third Armies. On October 15th, IDF tanks crossed the canal on rafts to secure a bridgehead. Then combat engineers working under heavy fire began building a bridge across the Suez. IDF forces were attacking hard along the Egyptian line to divert fire from the crossing site. Sharon crossed on October 16th. Grenadon's division followed the next day. Not all of his men made it. Egyptian shells hit the bridge and dozens of tanks toppled into the canal. But over 140 tanks had crossed, with each brigade supported by an infantry battalion. The IDF's plan was to trap the Egyptian Third Army between the Israeli forces on the east and west banks of the Suez. Thus began one of the hardest fought battles of the war. The Israelis had adapted to reality and were no longer rushing in with their tanks well ahead of infantry and air support. IDF tanks swept along the banks of the Suez and cut off the supply lines of Egypt's Third Army. But the Egyptians held their ground tenaciously. Have the Egyptian casualties been very heavy? Well, I would say so, yes. By October 22nd, Egypt began to press for a ceasefire. The IDF used this period to gain as much territory as possible before the superpowers forced an end to the fighting. Even today, Egyptians and Israelis strongly disagree about what happened in this period, how many men were lost, how bad each army's situation was, and ultimately, who won the October War. With the Israeli troops now in Egypt, on the West Bank, do you still feel that you have a victory? Yes, of course. If they have enough forces in the Western Bank, why didn't, didn't they went to Cairo? Why didn't they take Suez? Why didn't they take Ismailia? They started their own attacks, but they didn't succeed in making any defeat or making real casualties to our forces in the bridgeheads till they find a small point to attack in it, to move to the other bank, and they succeeded in reaching to the city of Suez because in this area, all our fighting troops were in the east, and some of them has been in the middle way between Cairo and Suez. In the morning, they succeeded in, in entering the city of Suez, and seven of their tanks are destroyed. After that, they pulled out, and never they came back. On October 24th, a final ceasefire between Egypt, Israel, and Syria took hold. The IDF had crossed into Africa, theoretically surrounding the Egyptians, but Egypt never relinquished the Suez Canal. The Egyptians think that they succeeded in this war. They think that they, if they placed some uh, few hundreds of soldiers and tanks in, the, in our bank of the canal, 
then they think that this, this is a victory for them. And uh, when the Arabs think that they have won or they have a big victory, this, is in, this encourages them. And the next thing you'll know is that in a year or two, we'll have another war and more casualties. In fact, just the opposite happened. The carnage of the October War helped to bring about a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, the first between an Arab nation and the Zionist state. The main phenomenon is that we established friendship between the two nations. Now there is a real friendship between the people of Israel and the people of Egypt. Friendship was not soon in coming for Israel and Syria. After the October War, Israel pulled back to its 1967 ceasefire lines. But border skirmishes were common, and the two nations battled again during Israel's 1982 war with Lebanon. Decades later, the two countries were still trying to decide the fate of the Golan Heights. The October War exacted a brutal price from all sides. In the Sinai, Israel lost almost 2,700 men, more than half of them tank soldiers. These losses touched virtually every family in this small country. The prosecution of the war, particularly the fight for the Sinai, is controversial to this day. Still, Israel insists it won the war. Egypt lost 11,000 men with 25,000 wounded, but here, as in most of the Arab nations, the October War is considered a tremendous victory. In Cairo, a large, very popular museum tells the story of the Egyptian army's most successful battle since the age of the pharaohs. Here, the story of the war is the story of the crossing. If you want to speak about the objectives, we succeeded in crossing the most difficult water barrier in the world and destroyed one of the strongest defense line. It was stronger than Magino line or Siegfried line in the Second International War. And we succeeded in destroying one third of the air forces of Israel and succeeded in destroying more than 800 tanks from the Israeli forces. And then what we achieved by this war. At the end, we took back our Sinai. Today, there is peace in the Middle East, but it's an uneasy peace. Perhaps the grudges are just too old, the conflicts too basic, and the combatants too steeped in the romance of the military tradition. Both Egyptians and Israelis tend to romanticize their battlefield victories no matter how high the death toll. We show the world that this can be beaten and can be conquered and suffer much losses. You know that they care about their human losses and we tried and insisted to deal with them and to give him a lesson that they can suffer a lot of human losses. They didn't win, but they did something uh, unique for them to cross the Suez Canal and to, to feel that they start the war and they capture some of the area. But the Israeli soldiers uh, and the Israeli army, I think they win. But I know the only reason that we have a peace treaty with Egypt is because the feeling what they have, because they feel they win, they win in the war. It's okay. Now we have peace treaty with them. The fighter's job is to fight when he needs to or when there is a necessity. Now I do not think there is a need to fight. But as a fighter, I'm ready at all times. If I receive an order to fight, I will fight. Remnants of the October 6th crossing still remain on the banks of the Suez. They're a reminder that it took a war and the loss of thousands of lives to settle the differences between two longtime enemies. 
On June 5, 1975, exactly eight years after the Six-Day War began, Anwar Sadat reopened the Suez Canal. On October 6, 1981, exactly eight years after the October War began, Sadat was assassinated. By dealing with Israel, the Egyptian president incurred the wrath of Arab extremists. But his legacy lives on. Egypt and Israel remain at peace. And the waters of the Suez flow unencumbered. <laughs>